Hello. Welcome. We are super excited that you all have joined us today for our topic. Um, if you haven't answered the poll question, please do that. It just popped up uh, and asked me if I wanted to answer it. Um, so welcome. And um, we're going to get started with our K-State Garden Hour series. I am Dr. Cheryl Boyer. I'm an associate professor and extension specialist for nursery crop production and marketing. And normally I'm the one behind the scenes pulling all the strings. So it's a treat to be a host today, especially for our speaker, Lynn Lowry. And I will introduce her in just a minute. But before we do that, I just wanted to do uh, it's a little bit of housekeeping, let you know about some changes. So we've mentioned we have a new webinar license. It has some new features. We're still figuring out all the bells and whistles. So we're glad you guys are hanging in there with us and it'll get easier and better. And certainly the recordings are going faster in the processing software. So that's exciting. Um, what the biggest change that we want you to know from your perspective, aside from the fact that you don't have to worry about your audio and video anymore, is that if you have a question, please use the Q&A function. If you use the chat box, we will get it as panelists. Not everybody will see it, but it helps us to sort of manage the questions and make sure we get to all of them and organize them and, and are conscious about um, grouping them together as much as possible. So if you have a question, use that Q&A function at any time throughout the webinar and we will be sort of, if we can answer them, we will. And if we can't, we will curate them for Lynn as she's speaking. And so we, she doesn't have to read them all. We will read them to her and she doesn't have to process them. So use that. Um, and if you have sort of a procedural issue, then use the chat box for that. But we want you to use the Q&A box. Um, our moderator today is Brooke Garcia. You heard her voice earlier. She is our training support specialist for our integrated pest management grant. And she is the whiz behind all of our graphics and behind all the communication on Facebook and all of that fun stuff. So we are a pretty fun team to work together. And um, her job today, aside from the intro slides and making sure everybody knows we're starting, is to keep track of the questions. So she's going to moderate and work through and make sure that she is keeping all those questions organized and addressing anything that comes up during the webinar. So she'll facilitate that question and answer part at the end. Um, we will be recording the webinar. I'll have it up on the website by tomorrow. Sometimes it's quick and it happens today and sometimes it's tomorrow. So we'll just get, out, get that out as quickly as we can. There's also an evaluation. You'll get an email about that, but it also will pop up as soon as the webinar is over. So we encourage you to just take it right away um, and then check that off the list and that helps us um, learn about how we're doing and how we can improve. So we really appreciate that. Um, we keep the website updated and that's on the Horticulture and Natural Resources website. That's the department that I'm in. It's the state level uh, department at K-State and um, that's where we're sort of housing everything for now. So make sure to check that and see um, what's coming up and I know there's only one more on this calendar right now, and that's me next week, but we have been planning uh, webinars through September. So we plan to get that updated in the next week or two, not week or two, by the end of next week, but hopefully before then so that you'll know what's coming up and you can just log on and register for all the fun stuff coming up. So just a little bit about us. We are all horticulture extension educators in K-State Research and Extension. And our role and our interest, interests are to help you all make informed decisions um, that are backed by research-based information in a non-biased way. So we're excited to share all of this content with you that's related to gardening and horticulture. And today's topic, pesticide label safety, is a really important one. Um, Lynn Lowry is the horticulture extension agent in Wyandotte County, and she worked for DuPont for 20 years. So she's very familiar with this topic and she's passionate about it too. Um, and then 17 years ago, she joined K-State Research and Extension. So we are just really thrilled to have her both as a colleague and as a speaker today. So um, give us a couple of minutes while we transition and Lynn gets her slides up and we will just get going and I've probably talked too much. So take it away, Lynn. All right. Little technical difficulty here. Okay, can you see the screen? Yep, there we go. All right. 
Well, I worked for DuPont for 20 years and I was in the marketing arena and I worked with a crew of people from development to toxicology, to sales, to marketing, to write pesticide labels for about the last five years of my stint at DuPont. So I'm very familiar with labels and I represent K-State Research and Extension. And we oftentimes do recommend the use of pesticides, but I want everybody to be safe in the use of pesticides. And with the knowledge of writing labels, I certainly do think that sometimes we don't always read the entire label. We jump right to the dose and mix the product and we don't look at any of the precautions. So I'm gonna walk through pesticide labels. I'm using homeowner pesticides as examples of where you will find the different information. So we'll get started. And if you have questions, again, use the Q&A button. What we're gonna to learn today is how pesticides are developed. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time explaining that. And it somewhat resembles our drugs that we take but right now you'll see with COVID that we're jumping through a lot of hoops to come up with a vaccine. And so the timeline is a little different for pesticides versus drugs that we take. We're gonna understand personal and environmental safety, those sections of the label, those are oftentimes jumped over and are very crucial to using the product safely. We will jump then to directions for use, and this is where most of you are familiar. This is where you find out what pests are controlled, the dose to use or the rate to use, and how to mix it up in a sprayer. So that you're familiar with, so we'll skip through that kind of quickly. And last but not least, there's always information on the products of where to store them and how to dispose of them appropriately. So what are pesticides? Basically, the side in the word pesticide means to kill. So basically, it's any product that will kill or control a pest. Or it could also be a product that repels a pest. And so we commonly go out in the evening, we put on some DEET to repel mosquitoes. So that would be an example of a product to repel. Pesticide groups, we categorize them overall as pesticides, but when we talk about the individual groups, fungicides is one, and that is a group of products that manage fungi. In parentheses are active ingredients. Active ingredients, which you'll learn here in a minute, are what actually controls the pest. In this case is chlorothalonil, which is an example of a fungicide. Herbicides control weeds. And an example would be glyphosate, commonly found in Roundup and now other products as well. Insecticides control insects. Malathion would be an example of an insecticide, one of the older ones. Miticides, well, miticides really don't exist anymore for homeowners. About all we can use are horticultural oils and sometimes soaps. So the old days of kelthane, that was a miticide that was years and years and years ago. It was very effective, but it's no longer on the market. So this is an example of different pesticide groups. So how are products developed? It costs about 200 million plus dollars to develop a new product, and it takes about 10 years to bring a product from the test tube to a formulated product through the registration process. EPA, or the Environmental Protection Agency, evaluates the pesticides, and their main concern is human health and the environment. And I'm just gonna list the types of tests that a manufacturer has to conduct before they can bring a product to market. And these are, some of them take six months, some of them can take up to two to four years to um, carry out. In the process, once it gets through some of the environmental fate and some of the safety regime, then the manufacturer can actually take the product out into the field and work with farmers to see how the product actually performs. But it has to hit certain hurdles before that happens. 
They also look at studies for the safety of humans and domestic animals. And you can see some of the tests here that are listed. And last but not least are non-target organisms. These would be like aquatic organisms or earthworms in the soil. Um, so these can be very extensive studies. And of course, the most important one for the manufacturer is product performance. And that's, like I said, they take them out into the field. They actually do a crop destruct. So when they spray the fields, then they have to destroy the crop until the product is registered. If you want further information about any of these studies, you need to go to the epa.gov site that's listed at the bottom of the slide. And they go into quite a bit of detail about each of these studies. The thing to keep in mind is once a product's registered, every 15 years, the product goes through a re-evaluation. And if there are new studies, say there's a new aquatic study, then EPA may ask the manufacturer to redo a certain set of studies. And then it's a business decision whether the manufacturer wants to do that. If they choose not to redo these studies, then they will probably cancel the registration. So not always when a product is canceled is it due to ill effects in the environment or human health. The Food Quality Protection Act was passed in 1996, and it brought forth a whole bunch of new testing to look at some of the dietary exposures that products have, as well as when products are used on multiple use sites, then our exposure is a lot higher. So this was critical because that's when we were reevaluating a lot of the older chemistry. And a manufacturer is always looking for a greener or safer compound to bring to market. And they're looking to phase out some of the older chemistry. So with this testing and continued testing, we are gonna lose more and more products. And an example of that, those of us who used to be able to buy diaz diazinon and Durzban for termites, those are no longer available to homeowners. Um, malathion, as soon as supplies are depleted, malathion is no longer gonna be available to homeowners as well. These products are being replaced by newer products like the spinosids of the world. So that's a good thing. We want to always be looking for safer products. Before we get into the labels though, let's talk about some basics. Before you pull any product off the shelf or go buy a product, you need to diagnose the problem. And a good place to start is with your extension office. They can help you to diagnose the problem and to select the right solution for that problem. Pesticides should always, and I repeat, always be the last control strategy. The other falsehood out there is when you go to a store and you buy organic produce, a lot of people feel that these are pesticide free and that's simply not true. They do use pesticides on much of the organic produce, but these products are usually derived from a natural source. They're usually non-persistent in nature and OMRI, the Organic Materials Review Institute, they designate them as organic products. But don't be fooled, these are not necessarily safe to some of our pollinators, our predatory beetles, our parasitoids, and sometimes they can be toxic to people and animals if they aren't used according to the label. So pesticide makeup. Again, we talked up front that the active ingredient it is what actually kills or repels the pest. But in that container, there's all kinds of inert ingredients. These inert ingredients have also gone through testing so that EPA is confident that there's not gonna be a problem with those ingredients. Many of those are wetting agents or like soaps that help the product to spread out on the leaf surface. 
and to stick to the target. Others can be water. They can be silica particles. Sometimes there's acidifiers and buffers in the mixture. Otherwise, some products would not last very long on the shelf. They would break down too quickly and would not be effective against the pest. So two products that are often confused are Roundup Ready to Use and Roundup Concentrate, or for a matter of fact, any ready to use product. Ready to use are convenient. There is no mixing. You buy the product, you go home, you pump it up, and you spray it on the target. The concentrate, on the other hand, allows one to change the dose for the plant you're trying to control or the pest you're trying to control. So I'll give you an example, a common problem that people call me with. I have poison ivy and I'm trying to control it. I bought this Roundup ready to use. I sprayed it. It's been 14 days and the plant is as happy as can be. The problem with the ready to use product is the dose for poison ivy isn't high enough to kill it. So a better option would have been to buy the concentrate, follow the label directions, mix the dose or the rate for the label, and then spray your target, which would have been the poison ivy. So they're both great products, but you need to read the label and know which product controls what. So convenience is one thing, but if you're trying to control a variety of plants from annuals to perennials, you might want to consider the concentrate. Here's two products that are often confused with one another. This day and age, we're always in a hurry. So if you look at this, the marketing people, they want you to know it's preen. So they use that bright yellow container and red. But if you're in a hurry and you go into Ace Hardware and you pick up a preen jug, make sure you read the front placard before you purchase. These products are very, very date different in nature. They work very differently, but they both say preen. They both have the word weed in it, but the one on the left, the weed preventer, is a pre-emergent weed control. So what you do is you put this product down as the weeds germinate, they come into contact with the chemical and it kills them. The active ingredient is trifluralin. The product on the bottom right is actually Roundup. It's a generic, the glyphosate is now generic, so there are a lot of products with glyphosate as the active ingredient. And as you all know, any green tissue that you spray with Roundup will die. So again, you need to pay attention when you're purchasing products as to what the product will do, and that is on the label. So let's talk about the basics of the front placard on a product. The manufacturer, this one happens to be Bear. The trade name is Tree and Shrub Insect Control. The trade name for another product might be Seven. The ingredient statement is always down here at the very bottom of the front placard. I have to get my readers out to read it. It's so tiny. Sometimes I think I need a magnifying lens. In this case, it's imidacloprid at 1.47% of the contents of this container. The majority of the contents are the inerts. And again, remember, they are all tested for safety. Signal word is also on the front placard. In this case, it's caution. All labels say keep out of reach of children. Here's two other products. This one's malathion, which is an insecticide. And this is Roundup. The Roundup has a caution label and the Malathion a warning. So what does that mean? What are signal words? It signifies the relative toxicity of the product. The LD50 is the lethal dose to kill 50% of the test animals. And in most cases, those are mice. So the smaller the number, the more toxic. So danger would be 
less than 50 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. So people get all hyped up about pesticides. They're scared to death to use them. But if you look under your own kitchen sink or maybe your laundry room, we have many products that carry a danger label that we use daily in our everyday living. So again, I want you to take from this that as long as we use products safely, read the entire product label and use them just as the label says, they can be used very safely. Now we talked about signal words. Captain Jack's bed bug, great name, isn't it? That is a product that does not have a signal word. It is derived from a bacterium that was found in a rum distillery in the Caribbean. And it is fairly safe to most beneficial insects, although in a few slides forward, you will see that you can't say that across the board. But just bear with me and I'll get back to that. But Captain Jack's is actually spinosa, and it is considered one of the organic compounds. Now let's talk about routes of exposure. So we're using these products. What do we have to be concerned about? First off, most exposure is th through dermal or skin. If we were a commercial applicator or a farmer and mixing up pesticides, at a bare minimum, we would have to wear a long sleeve shirt and long pants. And with some products, the label may state that we have to wear coveralls as well. All labels for farmers and applicators say that you have to wear socks and shoes. And for some products, chemical resistant footwear and chemical resistant gloves can also be required. Now, how do we know what we need to wear? We read the label. Another route of exposure is oral, and it's usually accidental. I hate to say it, but the picture on the bottom right is from my father's basement. Every fall, I would go to the basement and bring up all his pesticide concoctions. By the way, this is illegal. You cannot repackage or reformulate products. He would mix them up maybe in May, and this would be in the fall of the year. But this was convenient for him. He could use spray bottles, he could reuse his Roundup ready to use container, but this is illegal. You are to mix up your sprayer, spray it, and then dispose of that liquid on the area you're supposed to be treating, and then clean it and then put it away. You're not to mix stuff up and then leave it for three to four months in containers. But you can see where this bottom picture here looks an awful lot like milk. So if a grandchild would get in the basement, they may try to open this bottle and then accidentally be poisoned because of this. Inhalation is another way that we can be exposed. And the first thing that comes to mind here is seven dust. Seven insecticide is one of the most common homeowner products used today. And it's in a liquid formulation as well as a dust. And so this is very difficult to use a product like that without inhaling it. Some products will tell you that you need to have a respiratory protective device when using the product. That's not the case with the seven dust. The other thing to keep in mind is our eyes are very vulnerable, particularly when we are spraying trees, like for bagworms, or we're trying to control coddling moth in our apple trees. If you're spraying above your head, that's gonna drift back onto you. So you need to keep your skin covered, you need to keep your eyes covered, and a lot of product labels will say that you need to wear goggles or face shields. So again, we only have one body and we need to be safe and wear the protective clothing that the labels state. Now, if you inadvertently get exposed to these products, all of these labels have a first aid section. And it's really critical that you read these statements if exposed. In this case, this is the bear tree and shrub insect control product. 
and it causes moderate eye irritation. All labels will say to avoid contact with skin, eyes, or clothing. Always, they will say to wash thoroughly with soap and water after handling. If this product is swallowed, it says immediately call the poison control center or your doctor and to give the person a sip of water if they're able to swallow. And I want you to remember that because the next example is gonna have a very different response. The important thing to note is that at the bottom of this section is an 800 number, and that is for medical emergency. There are toxicologists on staff at all these manufacturers, and they're there to support you as well as the doctor. So I always tell people if there's an exposure, they need to pack up the product in a bag and take it to the doctor. Now this is malathion, its label, and its first aid section. And it says that this product is a cholinesterase inhibitor and atropine is antidotal. So it's important that you take this product with you and that you read the label before doing any steps. And again, down here is the 800 number that you would call for medical assistance. Now, if we look at another product that's very common for people growing fruit trees, this is Gordon's Liquid Fruit Tree Spray. It's basically three products in one. Captan is a fungicide, malathion is an insecticide, and carbaryl is an insecticide. So it's a very popular, convenient product for homeowners to use. If you look down under precautionary statements, it will say, do not get in eyes on skin or on clothing. We saw that before. Avoid breathing spray mist. Wear coveralls worn over short sleeve shirt and short pants, socks and chemical resistant footwear, goggles or face shield and chemical resistant gloves. So to use this product safely, you should be wearing exactly what the label states. If we look further on the label, this box is almost on all pesticides. So user safety requirements, you should wash hands before eating, drinking, chewing gum, using tobacco, or using the toilet. You should remove clothing immediately if pesticide soaks clothing. And you should not wash that clothing with your family's clothes. It should be separate. If wearing gloves, you should always wash the outside of the gloves before removing. A common question I also get in the office is the lawn care company just came to my house. They sprayed my yard for weeds. When can my children or pets go outside to play? The label will say when they can. In this case, it says, when sprays have dried. If you're putting out weed and feed, which is fertilizer with weed control in the fall of the year, it will tell you you can re-enter the area after the, the uh, dust has settled. Here's Captan. Captan is a fungicide used to control a lot of fungal diseases on fruits, nuts, and ornamentals. And it also serves, tells you exactly what you need to wear long pants, long sleeve shirt, shoes plus socks, goggles or face shield, and chemical resistance gloves. No flip-flops, no shorts. Again, we want to minimize dermal exposure. We're switching gears now away from personal safety, but let's look at the environment. Seven insecticide, is commonly used in our gardens around our homes. And if you read the environmental hazards section, this product will kill honeybees or may kill honeybees in substantial numbers. And it tells you not to use the product or direct it toward blooming crops or weeds. And if you also note, they say to contact your extension office for further information. So again, seven insecticide and many products can be deadly to our pollinators. This product is also extremely toxic to aquatic and estuarine invertebrates, which many products are. 
So again, you need to read the label, be aware of the restrictions and adhere to them. Now remember Captain Jack's dead bug? This was the product that's commonly used in organic production. It does not have a warning or a caution label. It doesn't have a signal word. So you would presume that it was safe to everything. Well, in this case, it can be deadly to bees as well. And this label specifically says not to treat areas with blooming, pollen shedding, or nectar producing parts of plants during a three hour period. It also is toxic to aquatic invertebrates. So it tells you not to contaminate storm drains, drain ditches, gutters, or surface waters. So again, don't presume that products are safe. Read the label, find out the hazards, find out the precautions and follow them. Now, how do we reduce exposure to pollinators? Well, first off, you avoid spraying areas with flowers or trees in bloom. And yes, trees do bloom. We don't particularly pay attention to them unless it's a cherry or a crab apple or a red bud, but all trees do flower. So you want to avoid using pesticides during those periods. Or you want to spray early in the morning or evening after bees return to the hive and flowers have closed. Now I will tell you that bumblebees, they don't return to their hive. They will often sleep on plants. So if you're gonna go out and spray, you need to knock around the plant you're trying to spray so that the bumblebees will fly off. You always want to direct the spray toward your targeted plants. Doesn't matter if you have pollinators out there or not, you need to keep the spray where its target is. You also wanna watch your wind. You want to reduce insecticide drift from getting on plants or insects that you're trying to protect. And of course, wherever possible, use less toxic products like um, some of the ones that don't have all the restrictions. And again, how would you know? You would read the label. So let's now go to directions for use. This is probably the part of the label we're all very familiar with. This is the part of the label that tells you what the product controls and where you are to use it. It also talks about the rate or the dose to use. In this particular case, this is bare disease control for roses, flowers, and shrubs. Where can I use it? You can use it on roses and flowers, azaleas, camellias, rhododendrons, landscape trees and shrubs, ground covers and vines, and house plants but you do not see any edible crops on this box. So if you were to spray your garden, that would be an off-label use and illegal. What will it control? In this case, anthracnose, black spot, flower blight, leaf spot, petal blight, powdery mildew, rust, scab, and southern blight. If it's not listed on the label, it's likely not gonna control it. This is Captain Jack's dead bug. Captain Jack's can be used in home gardens, lawns, and ornamentals. And it gets really explicit as to what edibles you can use it on. And again, if the crop is not listed, you cannot use it on that crop. You would have illegal residues on the fruit that you plan to consume. Here's a little more information on Captain Jack's label. And let's look at the box on apples and other pome fruit. Pome fruit would be crab, crab apples, mayhaw, pears, and quince. The pests that control would be coddling moth and European grapevine moth, leaf miners, leaf rollers, et cetera, et cetera. Again, if it, the pest is not listed, it's not gonna control it. The other thing to look at is there's some boxes. The maximum number of applications per year. In this case, you can use this product six times on your apples over the course of a year. You need to wait 10 days in between applications 
and you need to wait seven days between the last application and harvest. And that ensures that no residues will remain on the fruit and will be safe for consumption. You'll notice that for stone fruits, the days between applications are shorter and the days to harvest are a lot longer, almost twice as long for cherry, plum, fruit, and nectarine. So you need to pay attention to that because it's really critical for your personal safety. Remember the Gordon's liquid fruit tree spray that we talked about and that we had to wear a face shield and all that? Well, they have a 14 day harvest interval. So you have to wait 14 days between the last spray and harvest. And that's true for apple, cherry, grape, and peach. So let me give you a real life example of a call I received one day. A lady called me and she said that her husband was told to go out and spray the aphids on her roses. So he mixed up seven insecticide and he went out to spray the roses. Next thing you know, he came inside and he said, well, I had leftover spray, so I just sprayed the entire vegetable garden. And she says, guess what? My broccoli is ready to harvest. And she said, I need to know what to do. So she went out to the garage, got her label, brought it in, talked to me, and the label said that she needed to wait seven days before harvest. But the broccoli was ready to harvest today. And for those of you who grow broccoli, you probably don't have seven days to wait. That broccoli would bolt and start to flower and would be worthless. So she asked me, she said, can I cut that broccoli today, put it in my refrigerator and not eat it for seven days? And the answer is no. You need to leave it where it is because daylight, temperature, all that helps the product to break down on the crop. And so bringing it into a cold, dark environment would stop the breakdown process. So basically she lost that harvest for that year. The husband was in a little bit of a bind. Okay, the other thing to note on labels is oftentimes there are do nots. This is orthene insecticide. It's commonly used for insect control in trees and shrubs. And over in the application information, it tells you to not use it on cottonwood, Lombardy poplar, or viburnums due to possible uh, problems with toxicity. So again, if you did not read the entire label, you might do some damage to plants that you're trying to protect. Okay, so some more application guidelines that are on the label. These products will tell you when to apply them. Now we're back to the preen product. This is the glyphosate one, the one that's similar to Roundup. And this is true of most herbicides. For best results, you want to use them during sunny weather for this product above 60 degrees Fahrenheit when weeds are actively growing. Sometimes they'll say when weeds are young and actively growing. They'll also tell you to spray when the winds are calm so that you're not getting drift onto undesirables. So again, you need to pay attention to those temperatures. And again, this one says above 60 degrees. Some products are just the opposite. They have maximum temperatures. And in this case, Speed Zone and Weed Begone Max are two products that have Banville 2,4-D in them. These are called phenoxy herbicides. And when sprayed on foliage, if the temperature gives above 85 to 90 degrees, the product will actually become a gas, move off of the leaf surface, and will drift down to the neighbors. This picture on the bottom left is a tomato that's been impacted by spray drift. It's got a twisted leathery growth and that tomato plant will not grow out of that. The picture in the upper right is grape. Grapes are very sensitive to phenoxies. So a question that often comes in, 
well, I'm going to spray in the morning when the temperature is 70 degrees. Well, that's not good enough. If the temperature gets above 85 degrees for speed zone during that day, it can still what we call volatilize. It can move off of the leaf surface and drift onto desirable plants. So we need to be responsible. We need to read the label. We need to understand some of the risks that are involved. We're back to our preen. This is the glyphosate product. It will tell you on the label what rate to use and how to mix it. In this case, this product can be mixed in pump up sprayers, the one two gallon type. It tells you how many tablespoons per gallon and it tells you how much area that it will cover. It also has recommendations for a hose-in sprayer. I'm not a proponent of the hose-in sprayers. I think they're very difficult to determine the rate that you are delivering. Oftentimes, there's a high volume of water and it's very difficult to get an appropriate rate. The only good use of a hose-in sprayer is when you're trying to spray large trees and you need high water pressure to get the spray and good coverage. But again, you need to be real cautious about how that drifts back onto you. You want to keep your eyes covered with either a face shield or goggles. You want to be wearing protective clothing to cover every inch of skin exposed. And again, down at the bottom, it'll tell you to spray weeds and grasses until thoroughly wet. Now that doesn't mean you stand there and you spray until you have a pool of water sitting at the base of the plant. That would be a waste of chemical. And then where is that product gonna go? It's gonna go into the soil. It's gonna kill some of our uh, soil organisms and that's not what we want to do. The other thing, and it seems like common sense, but Bayer, on their disease control product, they tell you right up front, food utensils such as measure, measuring spoons and measuring cups should not be used for food purposes after use with fungicides. That's after use with any pesticide. The other thing I want you to note is move indoor house plants outside before treating. A lot of people will move their plants to their believe it or not, bathtub, and they'll spray them. Well, guess what? The next person who goes in to shower is going to have bare feet, and they're going to possibly absorb that chemical if that bathtub is not thoroughly cleaned after doing so. And that is, again, not permissible per the label. I don't know of any product that allows you to spray plants inside. Now, there might be soil drenches that you could put on a house plant and you could probably keep the plant inside. But for this particular product, you cannot do that. So again, we think common sense rules, but obviously Bayer wants to make sure that you use their product safely. The other thing is if there's a compatibility issue, some of these products you cannot mix with other products without there being problems. And Captan is a fungicide that a lot of people use on their fruits, nuts, and ornamentals. And it doesn't like alkaline. It doesn't like alkaline water. It doesn't like lime. So you have to, again, read the label, make sure you're understanding all sections and how to properly use the product. These people spent 200 million bringing this product to market. They want you to use it safely and to be happy with its performance. Last but not least, storage. I get a lot of calls saying, you know, where should I keep this stuff? Well, if you have a storage area with a lock and key, that's where I would put it. You want it out of reach of children. It will say that right up front on all labels. Keep out of reach of children. You should store it in the original container. Don't do like my dad and mix it up in a jar or my old ready to use container. You want it to be a dry place. You want it to be where the temperatures are pretty moderate. In this particular case, this is the tree and shrub product from Bayer. 
they do not want their product frozen. It says right under storage conditions, protect from freezing, okay? So an out shed without heat would not be a good place for this because in the winter in Kansas, we oftentimes get freezing temperatures. Freezing sometimes causes the product to break down or to not be um, as potent as it would be if you stored it into a temperate area. Seven insecticide, on the other hand, has just the opposite. They don't want their product stored where temperatures exceed 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, if we had it in an outbuilding, most likely that outbuilding would get way over 100 degrees in Kansas. So again, you need to read the entire label, even the storage and disposal. So let's talk about container disposal. This is what I recommend. I recommend triple rinsing your empty pesticide container. If you have leftover pesticide and you want to dispose of it, you need to call your waste disposal um, office that's in each county and they'll tell you where to bring it. And sometimes there will be a fee for disposal. But if you've used all the product, then I suggest you triple rinse it. What that means basically is you fill it full of water, you shake it up, and then I pour it right back into my spray container, my one gallon, two gallon spray container. And I do that three times. And then I take that rinse aid and I go out and I spray it on my lawn or a site that is on the label. Now it won't kill anything, but you need to spray it on the designated site. You never, ever, ever, ever pour it down your driveway, which goes into the drainage ditch, which then goes into the stream, which then goes into the river. And guess what? You pull our drinking water out of that river. So you want to send these containers to our landfill as clean as possible. Okay, so we're about to wrap up. The first thing I want you to do, properly identify the problem or the pest. And if you need help, go to your extension office and they'll be glad to help you. Once you diagnose the problem, then you select the appropriate product. Remember, pesticides are your last resort. Make sure the pest is on the label and make sure the crop that you're trying to protect is listed as well. You wanna use the recommended rate a little bit more isn't good. These people have spent a lot of time and money coming up with a rate that is effective. So use what they tell you to use and not more. More could end up being an environmental hazard. Time the application to the most vulnerable stage of the pest. So if it's a weed, most weeds are controlled if they're young and actively growing. Very few weeds will be controlled in August when it's hot, dry, humid, because they just don't take in the chemical and so kill is not effective. When you're talking insects, certain life stages are more sensitive. Usually the nymph stage is more sensitive than the adult stage. Very few insecticides work on the egg stage. Whatever you do, you need to read the entire pesticide label and follow the directions. So if you need to understand how to manage a pest, contact your local K-State Research and Extension office. There's also a great website, which is our plant pest problems page. And say you have a problem with Japanese beetles, you would go to that site, click on J, Japanese beetles would come up, and you would find a one to one and a half page document that talks about Japanese beetles, their life cycle, and recommended control strategies. So use that site because it's a great resource for all of us. Last but not least, this is where I go for pesticide information. It's the National Pesticide Information Center. And I believe that Cheryl's gonna put all this on the webpage, all these resources. So with that said, I will open it up to questions. Thank you, Lynn, that was awesome. Um, I learned so much and I know 
a lot about pesticides, but it is always so good to hear the reminder and hear it said again in a calm voice and to explain words. I mean, even just back in the beginning when you were talking about the three signal words, um, I think it's sometimes not always easy to remember which one is the scariest one. So thank you for that. We do have some questions. I am going to pass it over to our moderator, Brooke Garcia, and we'll get to as many of them as we can before one o'clock and then we will end on time. Perfect. We don't have too many questions, so I think it should be pretty easy to get through them all. Um, one of our first questions was regarding flowers of sulfur and um, specifically relating to the flowers of sulfur pellets to repel triggers in the yard. Do you know of any precautions, Lynn? You're talking sulfur, the, the product, I don't know what flower of sulfur is. Mm, yeah, that's all I have in, um, so yeah, it could just be sulfur pellets, or, I've heard of sulfur pellets to repel triggers in the yard. Do you know any precautions about that? What I would say is again, all the thing that's dangerous when you try to make recommendations without knowing the exact product, every product formulation is going to have different precautions based on what the inert ingredients are in that product, as well as the percent of the active. So I would say the best thing to do would be to read the label on that sulfur bag and follow it to a T. I would just be speculating what that label might say. Perfect, great advice. Um, the second question we have, um, do insecticides have a shelf life or, as a concentrate or mixed? And then yes, how- they do. Yeah, and how can you find that information? Okay. You know that 800 number that I showed you under the uh, first aid? You can always call that number. They will direct you to the appropriate people. There's also a safety data sheet, which is not on the product itself, but all products have a safety data sheet. And that safety data sheet can be found online and it will tell you the shelf life. Most products, I say most, there's always exceptions, are two years in an unopened container. The reason it says unopened container is because once it's opened, you don't know how tight the lid's been put on, humidity can get in there, it can you know, change the degradation of the product. So again, the safety data sheet, or you could call the manufacturer and get that information, but they don't last as long as you would think. And they, the, the issue then becomes, if the product is compromised inside the jug, then it's probably not gonna be as efficacious or not work as well on the pest. Great, thank you, Lynn. And next question, um, and this is just more of a clarification, but when Garden Tech purchased the seven brand a few years ago, they started replacing the active ingredient, but kept the name. Um, and so they said, consequently, not all seven formulations are the carbaryl. Um, and then could you just kind of clarify that for participants? It is true. So when, when a manufacturer comes up with a name of the product, they basically buy the rights to that name. And so that's very common with kelthane as well. Kelthane was a miticide years ago, but you can now buy kelthane and guess what? It doesn't control mites. So it can be very confusing. So again, you always need to read the entire label, which would include that little bitty, bitty, bitty box and the little bitty, bitty, bitty writing on the placard that has the active ingredient. Good question and good comment. Thanks. Um, so someone had also asked, do you have to use a pump sprayer or can you use a spray bottle um, when applying pesticides? You could probably use a spray bottle, except here's the bugaboo. Most of the labels tell you how to mix up per gallon sprayer. So a spray bottle is going to be a fraction of a gallon and to mix it up correctly, you're going to need to do some math. And if you're like me, math isn't uh, high on my list of things to do. But yeah, you could. Um, again, you only want to mix up enough to use. You don't want to have a lot of leftover. 
And if, you know, that's the other thing, a spray bottle is used for all kinds of things. And so a sprayer that you purchase at any place that's meant for pesticides is a little easier not to get confused with maybe a household sprayer. So yes, you could, but mixing could be an issue and then identification of it as a pesticide could be misleading. Great. I, I could definitely understand where that would be tricky to do the math and correctly apply. So good question. Um, the next question, is there a journal template that I can record applications? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, what I use at home is I have a calendar in my garage. And so what I do is when I, first off, I do two things. I try to put my pesticide labels, take them off, they're, they're sticky. So I take them off and then I make a copy of that and put it in a sleeve so that when the pesticide, you open it and you pour it and it runs down the side of the jug, I try to wipe that off, you know, wearing rubber gloves, of course, the best that I can, but sometimes that label gets soaked or inadvertently torn. So I try to make a copy of that. Now, granted, I have a, a copy machine here at work. And then I stick the label back on because that is sticky. And then I have a copy of it so that it's protected from spills and dirt and tearing. So where was I going with that? Oh, so then what I do is when I spray a chemical, I write on my calendar exactly what I've done and what I sprayed it on. And then I have a record that way. But I suppose you could just write it down in a notebook, whatever's easiest for you. Yeah, I know that question kind of varies based on like residential versus commercial too. But, you know, like in a commercial setting, I know they would use a pesticide application like field record book or record keeping book. Um, and then I guess this is kind of an add on to that question. But, you know, how long should those records be kept? Who is Franny on here? I know, I was going to see if Franny maybe had it, because she'll kind of have the commercial, you know, standpoint. I will right? tell you from a homeowner's perspective, right or wrong, there is not going to be anybody coming out to check your spray records unless you inadvertently use a product incorrectly and kill your neighbor's tree or drift the product onto their, their garden. Mm -hmm. If they report you, then you might see somebody from the Department of Ag checking it out. You're right. Commercial applicators are, are held to such a high standard. They have to keep spray records. And for many years, they have to keep that. They have to keep wind direction. They have to keep uh, all kinds of information. And I'm positive there are records that you could probably download from the Department of Ag on that. But I'm hoping most of the people on the phone are homeowners who really need the help with pesticides. Franny, did you have any other comments? She might not. Yeah, she may have stepped aside. Franny is our, our state um, pesticide and safety integrated Myth pest management coordinator. I just said that all wrong, but that's who Franny <laughs> is and she's on our panel. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, we can always link her contact information yep. on our website too. That would probably be a good thing. Um, so the last question in the Q&A and then we had a couple questions um, in our chat. So let me get this last question. Um, is it okay to use different products in a sprayer? you know, Roundup, pesticide, et cetera? I do not recommend that. Here's why. If you don't thoroughly clean the product in between sprays and you have glyphosate or Roundup in that container, I have seen it damage um, uh, desirables. If you do a thorough job of cleaning, and usually that's a 10% of bleach solution will thoroughly clean your pesticide container, although it will be very corrosive to metal, then you know you can take a gamble. But these containers are not that expensive. You can buy a one gallon sprayer for 10 to 15 bucks. And it's well worth having a designated weed control sprayer versus a fungicide insecticide sprayer so that you don't do damage to desirables. 
Um, so one of the questions, do the labels address shelf life on products? I know we kind of answered that, but if you wanted to repeat. Your... Not on the label, but that's on the safety data sheet that you can download online. Great. And then final question, where can I find caution and info labels for my storage area with the symbols for pesticides? Boy, that'd be a franny question too. <laughs> We will do our best. I will try to link to some resources for that on the um, on the website where we record all that. Oh, Franny unmuted. Maybe she wants to add something. Sorry, I was I was on a call. Um, what were you guys wanting me to answer? <laughs> um, record keeping books and labels for um, storage areas. Um, record keeping books. There's a wide variety. We have one for. Um, it's it's more for private applicators, but you guys could use it because it just asks for active ingredient um, and that type of information. So that would be a good um, document to use. And Franny, uh, one of the get questions those at your is, extension office. One of the questions is how long should I keep the records of what I've applied? Do you have? Um, any I would say that probably I would go for two years. Is like typically what we say for other applications. So, I mean, that would be a good um, time frame to try and keep them for. Great, and then that last question was, where can I find caution and info labels for my storage area with the symbols for pesticides? Um, Gimplers.com has a good, is a good um, resource. And you can also, the through NPIC, they have a pesticide, a national, pesticide um, group that is printing some of that stuff too. All right, well that's okay. all the questions. So Cheryl, I'll let you wrap us up. All right, so thanks again for everybody joining the Garden Hour series. And this is uh, just as a reminder, K-State Research and Extension Project, and we're always here and happy to help you. Uh, use the link Brooke shared earlier to find your local agent and they'll help you out with your very specific question in your area because it does vary across the state. Sorry. So, oh. um, okay, so. Oh, Franny. Oh. Did you want to add something? Okay, we, so this will be recorded. I'll send you a reminder. Please do the um, evaluation when it pops up or via email and we would really appreciate your feedback. So once again, thank you. Have a great week. We'll see you next week and I'll be talking about substrates. <laughs>